So welcome to a special episode of the Prop G Pod. Uh, today we're with Blake Scholl, the CEO and founder of Boom Supersonic, uh, an American aviation firm that is building the world's fastest commercial plane. Prior to founding Boom, Blake held leadership roles at Amazon and Groupon and co-founded mobile technology startup Kima Labs. Blake, welcome. Good to be here. Thanks for having me, Scott. So full disclosure, I'm an investor and an advisor in Boom. Um, the thesis was simple. I think that every multi-trillion dollar company, any company that's aggregated over $100 billion in market cap has effectively built a time machine. Amazon saves you 11 days at the grocery store. Netflix saves you 12 days of advertising. And I think that as income inequality rages, as it will over the next 50 years, and there's going to be no shortage of billionaires hitting their midlife crisis who will decide that the ultimate flex is not to do this ridiculous nihilist thing and go fast upward, but go fast horizontally such that they can live life in what is the most habitable planet uh, in our solar system. And that's how I found you. So start off, what is Boom Technologies? Uh, so Boom is building uh, basically the successor to Concorde. So think flights that are faster, uh, but also dramatically more affordable and dramatically more sustainable. So think getting from Tokyo to Seattle in four and a half hours instead of the, the 10 or 11 it takes today. Think uh, London to New York in about three hours and 45 minutes and being able to do all of that initially for about the price of a business class ticket today. And ultimately, we want to get this down to the point where it's not just for the ultra wealthy, uh, but, uh, but where anybody can benefit from uh, faster travel and being able to get around the planet more easily. And like, like you said, living life here on Earth, which is the best place to live. So there's, there's sort of the materials, there's propulsion, and then there's avionics. And you referenced the Concorde. This is you know, 1960s technology, effectively. How, how have each of those changed, and why does that make this the right time for supersonic? Yeah. It's, you know, looking backwards, it's really impressive technologically what was accomplished 60 years ago with slide rules and drafting paper and converted military engines, no, no computers. And, um, and, but today, we've changed everything about airplanes except how fast they fly. We've got the ability to do digital design and simulation, which allows us to build far more efficient aerodynamics. Mm -hmm. uh, we have new materials like carbon fiber composites that allow us to build strong, lightweight, very complex aerodynamic shapes. We have engines that are cleaner, quieter, more fuel efficient, that can run on sustainable aviation fuel. And then everything that's electronic has gotten dramatically lighter. Which and, and, and weight is the enemy of performance on an airplane. It's the enemy of efficiency. So light is the name of the game. So my understanding of any sort of civil aviation is that effectively, whether it's in Boeing or it's the Concorde, was the Concorde at EAD? Who actually built the Concorde? Was it, it was a joint venture between the French and British governments. Got it. Uh, it, was, it was very much kind of the, the brethren of Apollo, yeah. where the, the, it was the height of the Cold War. It was established in 1962 via a treaty between the two governments. Huh. And the goal was not to go usher in a new era of commercial supersonic flight. The goal was really to show up the Russians, much like Apollo. And so 1969, we had the first moon landing. We had the first Concorde flight. Uh, both of them very impressive technical successes, but commercially bridges to nowhere. Yeah, and they had, didn't they respond with like the TU-72 or something like that? Uh, TU-144, it was, uh, people called it the Concorde ski. Yeah. And, I, and it flew a couple flights, uh, crashed, uh, was, you know, did a couple mail runs and then was shut down. But each one of these, it feels as if, if you were to take a 737 or an Airbus Neo, you could reverse engineer it to massive government subsidies at some point. How do you, how do you get this thing in the air without billions of dollars in government funding? Um, so we, we fund the company really through three sources of capital. Uh, there's investor capital. We've raised about $400 million in investor capital so far. Then there is customer money. Mm -hmm. And uh, we already have two airlines, United Airlines and American Airlines, that have made meaningful non-refundable deposits for their airplane. Uh, so that's a source of capital. It's also a source of investor confidence. Um, and then lastly, we, we do get some government money. So there are defense applications of the airplane. Uh, we've received a couple of rounds of US Air Force contracts. Uh, the state of North Carolina put together uh, a really generous package to help us build the super factory in Greensboro, North Carolina. Uh, so it's those three sources of capital working together. And I, I believe there's a magic 
in uh, investor capital and the diligence that requires a company to go through, validation through customer cash commitments that, by the way, become an increasing source of capital because airlines do prepay for their airplanes. And then lastly, particularly when we can create economic value there's, uh, or create defense value, there's government capital there too, too but that's not, the pri that's not the only source. And so my understanding is it now takes longer to get from New York to Dallas than it did in the 70s. The planes have been actually slowed down because of air traffic control and fuel constraints. Is that right? Uh, the, the planes are very slightly slower at, at the speeds they fly, depending on what exactly you're comparing. And then uh, airport congestion's gotten way worse. Uh, air traffic control has gotten more congested. And so, if you look at this, the, the scheduled flight times, right. uh, they're worse. Yeah. And what's what is the most difficult thing about building a supersonic plane? Is it the materials? Is it the engine? The propulsion? I know that, and this is a bridge to a question, you initially were going to outsource building an engine. Mm -hmm. I've, I've always been taught that planes are basically a very expensive living room, some a more expensive computer, and then a several million dollar piece of technology called a jet engine. Mm -hmm. But you've decided to go vertical and produce yeah. your own jet engines, which it, at first glance seems really difficult, mm -hmm. that there are good people making jet engines, but you're going to, in addition to making the plane, you're going you're to go vertical into the the jet engine. Explain yeah. the strategy. So, so l let me zoom out high level first and talk about where the challenge is and isn't. Yeah. And then we could, with the, the engine's a very fascinating case study. Uh, so it's not does the, the market exist. I, I think it's intuitive uh, to most people that at business class prices, many, many, many people want faster flights. I don't know anybody who wants to spend more time on an airplane. Right. And you know, with, with the pre-orders, that we've shown that airlines want this. So the market exists, the technology exists. We've already built uh, a test airplane. Uh, the regulations exist. We don't need any exemptions to safety rules or noise rules. Mm -hmm. The supply chain exists. The same people who are building parts for Boeing and Airbus are building parts for our airplane. Uh, so all of that exists. And so the, the, the difficulty of the effort is really capital and just the sheer complexity. Like this will be one of the most um, complex safety critical machines ever created. Mm -hmm. and, and we take that, that responsibility of creating something that's gonna be safe for our friends and family and loved ones really seriously. So okay, to the, to the engine. Mm -hmm. um, so a uh, quick crash course in engines. So it turns out supersonic engines are actually not really all that different from subsonic engines mm -hmm. because there's an adapter that sits in front of them called an intake that basically takes supersonic air, slows it down, makes it subsonic, feeds it to the engine, and then there's an adapter on the other side called a nozzle that takes hot, high-pressure subsonic air and speeds it back up to supersonic speeds. And the engine in the center, it's basically just a hotter version of a subsonic jet engine. Yeah. And so when we, when we first... Um, uh, got going with the program, you know, our strategy was least risk to rate production. So if I can buy something off the shelf rather than recreate it, that's, that's definitely the path I want to go down, knowing that later on we can always iterate, improve, et cetera. And so we, we spent time with uh, the, the three companies that build jet engines, and they're really only three make big ones on the planet, and we looked at taking a, a subsonic jet engine and kind of shoehorning it into a supersonic airplane. And, and it turns out you can do that, but it, it comes with a couple of, uh, a couple of big drawbacks. Mm -hmm. um, one is, so subsonic engines are designed to be at full power for only a few minutes at takeoff. And then uh, at cruise flight, they're throttled back and, that, you know, the, the, uh, and they're not running at maximum power, maximum temperature. Supersonic's the reverse. You're full power at uh, takeoff, or sorry, full, full power, uh, throttled back at takeoff, and then you're full power in supersonic cruise flight. Mm -hmm. so, you're, so you're spending a lot of time at maximum power, maximum temperature. So it blows through spare parts uh, far more quickly. And then the other piece is business model. So uh, uh, the, the subsonic engines today are basically given away, and all the money is in the spare parts that are marked up like 4X. And so we looked and said, hey, if we shoehorn an engine that's not designed for a long time at supersonic flight, and we're marking up the spare parts crazy, then the engine spare parts ended up being something like 40% of the total cost of supersonic flight. And, and we looked and said, hey, if we design a new engine uh, for reliable supersonic flight and we tweak the business model so it's, it's not all about replacing broken parts, we can significantly reduce the total cost of supersonic flight, make it available to more people in more places. And uh, so that's a, that's a little bit of a long-winded explanation. But it's probably worth saying this is the same thing SpaceX does. Like if you look at basically every new successful aerospace company, 
uh, they build their own propulsion. SpaceX builds their own engines. Blue Origin builds their own engines. Relativity builds their own engines. And basically, every uh, electric aircraft startup also builds their own engines. Yeah, and talk a little bit. I remember one of the things about the Concorde was the sonic boom mm -hmm. that inhibited its ability to go over land and sort of kind of hamstrung its route, its mission profile. As, have there been any advances around sound? Yeah, so um, yes and no. Uh, so there, there were two noise issues with Concorde. Mm -hmm. And one, as you mentioned, is sonic boom, uh, which is it's basically the sound the airplane makes anytime it's supersonic. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's kind of like a double bang, kind of a <laughs> type sound. The, uh, and Concorde, so for that reason, they could fly over land, but they had to fly subsonic. And Concorde was a very poor subsonic machine. Uh, it, it, it flying, not flying supersonic, it did not do well. And then the other Nori's question is takeoff and landing noise. Uh, and Concorde had these converted military engines with afterburners that were just rip roaring loud. And so with, with Overture, we said, hey, uh, we're going to solve this sonic boom problem in steps. And on step one, first off, we're going to design the airplane to be quiet for takeoff and landing. Mm -hmm. So it's no louder than any other airplane flying at the airport today. In fact, it meets the latest generation noise standards. Um, and, uh, and that, for that reason, should be welcomed at airports around the world. Uh, and then we're going to optimize the airplane to be efficient, both supersonic at Mach 1.7, as well as right under the speed of sound at Mach uh, 0.94. And so over land, we can fly efficiently subsonic, 20% faster than other airplanes today. And out over open ocean, we fly two times faster. And down the road, you know, I think people are going to want supersonic flight everywhere. And when there are regulations that support that, we'll build a second generation airplane that can do it. Do we need to fix this mic? I just saw his mic fall down. Oops. Do you want to just clip it up? Perfect. So uh, sustainability, what is the um, gas consumption per hour uh, versus regular commercial aircraft, recognizing you can cut that in half because you're going twice the speed? Mm -hmm. But talk about the sustainability. Yeah, so, so flying faster is more energy intensive. Uh, so it, cons it consumes more fuel, and that's why uh, sustainable aviation fuel is, is fundamental to our approach here. Today's, today's airplanes, the Boeing and Airbuses of the world, they can run on regular jet fuel, and they can run on sustainable fuel, but only up to 50-50. Mm -hmm. uh, so even the best sustainable fuel, at most you could do is cut the carbon in half. And uh, since we're designing the aircraft and the engine from scratch, uh, we're designing both to be compatible with 100% sustainable aviation fuel, which means uh, you can get all the way to net zero on supersonic, actually before you will be able to on a subsonic jetliner. Um, and that's, uh, so, so it'll, be a, it'll be a leap forward in sustainability. The, 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 the way I think about comparing this is t today flying on a subsonic airplane, say across the Atlantic, mm -hmm. is like driving a not very good SUV across the ocean. And, um, the, and flying on Overture supersonic is going to be like driving a Tesla across the ocean. If you drive it the way I drive mine, it's probably more energy intensive, but it's a different kind of energy. And so the energy costs become an economic consideration, not a climate consideration. And how big is the fuselage? Talk about passenger comfort. Yeah, so Concorde was famous for um, not being comfortable. Uh, the boarding door was pretty short. Most people had to duck to get on the airplane. And then they had the, the equivalent of about three rows of floor-to-ceiling equipment racks with a really narrow aisle. So by the time you're even in the passenger cabin, you know, you're convinced, this thing is tiny. I've got I to gotta squeeze my human to get to my seat. Um, and we want to build something that is uh, so comfortable that people almost wish the flights were longer. So it's uh, especially uh, one of the aerodynamic features of the airplane is it's bigger up front and smaller in the back. Mm -hmm. uh, that makes the, it's a feature called area ruling. It makes the whole airplane much more efficient. Um, which is part of how we're able to get the fares down. Uh, but the boarding door is the biggest part of the airplane. Uh, it's about an inch bigger than a boarding door on a 737. And then you step into the, the front cabin, which has like cathedral ceilings, like eight foot tall ceilings, two seats on each side of the aisle, uh, lots of space. And then as you go to the back of the airplane, the aisle is this beautiful oval shaped. Mm -hmm. So the, the oval aisle in the center is big enough that you can pass somebody else in the aisle. Or if there's a drink trolley, you can actually walk past it to get to the lav. And the back cabin, is, it's smaller. It's about the cross-section of a large business jet. Uh, and back there, we go to one plus one seating. Mm -hmm. And we've, we've joked that maybe seat 1A should actually be at the back of the airplane, because it's just so nice and private. And, uh, and the, we've rearranged where the bags go, so there's no overhead bins. You can stand up at your seat and not bump your head uh, for, mo for most people. So it's, uh, we've, we, the seats are different. 
uh, but we've designed them to be comfortable, and we've, we've put a lot of thought into making sure the first impression is one that people are going to be really excited by. And what's the cost of the plane relative to other commercial airliners? Uh, so it's a, it's a more expensive airplane. Um, the uh, we sell them for two hundred million a copy, yeah. uh, and after discounts, we think a seven eighty seven goes for about one fifty. Got it. Um, uh, but the the thing that makes the the thing that we focus on is what is it going to cost for passengers to be able to fly on this? Right. And the lower that number is, the more people are going to be able to benefit from supersonic flight, and the more profitable airlines will be. And a thing a lot of people overlook is with a a supersonic airplane, you could do as much as twice the flights with the same airplane and crew just because it's faster. Uh, you could schedule North Atlantic flights to go over and back twice in a day, hmm. uh, and so that's less crew cost, less catering cost. Uh, less maintenance cost because maintenance is proportional to hours, not flights, uh, and, the, and it's and it's great for the crews because they actually get home to their, their families. And so the result of that is uh, when you go faster, yes, the um, the fuel costs are higher; it's more energy intensive, uh, but a lot of other costs come down. Mm -hmm. And that utilization benefit, getting better, more work out of the assets, is part of how the economics work. And we had a discussion about this uh, last night. You're obviously going after airlines as your primary customer. Mm -hmm. And when I, when I heard about this, I always thought the bigger market was going to be in private aviation for kind of billionaires running out of time. Mm -hmm. You know, the average age of a billionaire is 71. That demographic has grown faster than any other income. People worth more than, I think, 200 million, uh, that as a percentage of people who were worth more than two, it's grown faster than any demographic group. And the only thing they can't buy, literally, is time. I always thought that would be the primary market, but you think it's airlines. We think it's airlines, and the, uh, and the it comes back to the thing you raised earlier about sonic boom. Yeah. So if if there were supersonic flight over land, supersonic business jets would absolutely be where this would start. And for a long time, that was the assumption in the field that when supersonic comes back, it'd be a, it'd be a business jet for the ultra wealthy. And I, I think that's something that should exist. But so let's put it in context. Uh, Eighty percent of high-end business jet miles in the world, like I'm talking the Gulf Streams, like the best ones, are over land, and those airplanes already fly at about ninety percent of the speed of sound. Yeah. Uh, there's a speed limit of Mach one. It's really stupid, but there's a speed limit over land, and so that because means because of the noise. Because it's of the supposed to be about cause the noise, but if it were really about the noise, it would have been a noise limit, not a speed limit. But li literally, the the, the the federal regulations say thou shalt not exceed Mach one. It doesn't right. matter if you suck noise out of the atmosphere. This will get changed eventually, but it's, it's, it's really hard to change. And uh, as a startup, you don't want to bank, uh, uh, bank your entire business plan on changing a regulation that's been entrenched for 50 years. So, so the, the, the pitch for a private owner, unless they do a lot of international flying, and there's some people who do that will buy this, Mm -hmm. uh, but the pitch is, hey, here's an airplane that's more expensive than a G6. It's smaller than a G6. It's got less range than the G6, and it's not faster 80% of the time the way you use it. So you know, in, w with those headwinds, we, we have sold a few, and we'll, we'll continue to sell a few. But the, uh, the, the, the pitch for airlines is very different. Because United doesn't fly the same airplane between New York and Los Angeles that they fly from Los Angeles to Sydney. Mm -hmm. uh, so the notion of, hey, airline, I've got an airplane that you're going to want to deploy on your transoceanic routes. This is an airplane that's going to make the most sense the more coastal the city pairs. And they say, great, that's how we use our 787s. That's how we use our 777s. We understand how to deploy an airplane in the right route. But only for a tiny number of people do they actually have their own individual fleet with different airplanes for different purposes. So let's talk a little bit about this through the lens of being a startup founder. So a bunch of founders here. You're, you've raised $400 million? What was the first round? Did you have a seed round? We had, we had a seed round. Um, so I, I don't think the, the company could have really gotten started if I hadn't been able to, to, to put in some seed capital myself. I, I'd sold my last company to Groupon. And uh, there's nothing like working on internet coupons uh, to make me want to work on something that's going to matter. Right. And, uh, and so I had a little, bit of, a little bit of exit money, not a lot. Uh, and I put in about half of my savings. Uh, hired the first uh, dozen or so engineers, yeah. and then we and then we did our first external seed round. I so think it was mind, less than a million dollars. We're amongst friends, we're amongst founders. How much money of your own money did you put in to start this thing? Uh, it's right around a million total. So a million bucks, and that that gets you to proof of concept, a presentation, some engineering plans. What does that get you? Yeah, it was a, it was a credible team and uh, a lot of math that says that it works. Got it. 
And so who were the first critical hires? Were they engineers? Were they marketers? Were they product people? Uh, they were all engineers. The, the, uh, the, 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 uh, day zero, there was, you know, there was a lot of doubt. Like, A, is this possible? Everyone remembers Concord, and it didn't, it didn't work yeah. economically. And um, you know, how is a startup going to be able to go uh, build a supersonic airliner? And so we needed to assemble a dream team. Yep. And what, what I learned pretty quickly was that when you tell people you're building a supersonic jet, like their, their first question is, are you crazy? And, and sometimes they don't say it out loud, but you can tell it's the question. Uh, and then, but if you could, if I could convince them that, that maybe, like maybe I wasn't crazy, then the second question is how can I help? And so we got our pick of the best people, and we've and the more progress we've made in showing that this is really happening, this is really working. There's a, like there, there's like a, a, a decent shot at success. Uh, that our ability to go get great people has only gone gone up. But the, the, the core of the company on the early days was, was very technical. It was all engineers. But the Series A, B, and C rounds, were these individuals who were aviation enthusiasts? Were these people who invest in technology? What was the profile uh, of the from investor? From the, 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 the investor base. So the, the investor base has always been a combination of some venture capital and some... Uh, and some high net worth individuals. You know, so for example, our, our A round was led by the, the Y Combinator uh, yeah. Continuity Fund. Mike Moritz invested personally. Reed Hoffman invested personally. Uh, our B round was uh, Lorraine Jobs' family office led that round. Our, our C round, uh, the, as we've gotten closer to delivering airplanes, it's made more sense for institutional capital. Bessemer, uh, Bessemer invested, Prime Movers Lab invested. When I hear those people's names, I think of potential customers. Is part of the seduction of investing that they're going to have some sort of purchase rights? Um, I probably shouldn't talk about that on stage. Uh, we'll take that as so. a yes and move on. So um, what, I mean, I, I think it's just so impressive that you're able to raise $400 million for a product that's not going to probably launch till 29. Is that right? 2020? Um, yeah, I mean, the, to, to give you a sense of the timeline, the factory's under construction now. We've already built the te first test airplane. We'll have the first unit off the line in three years, in the air in four, and ready for passengers in six. So, so yeah, 2029 for first commercial flights. First commercial flight. So you've raised $400 million. You need to raise a couple billion. Is that right? That's right. And so venture investors, there's passion investors that are looking, I don't know, for the first one or want to want to own 001. Um, and then there's investors that are looking for, you know, return. Venture investors usually like stuff that offers a potential 5 to 10x return to get rid of the stuff that doesn't work. This thing, I guess, I mean, technically the company could be worth a lot as you, well, will be worth much more as you get closer to proof of concept. But it just seems like an exceptionally high hurdle for, for investors that, okay, you need to raise $2 billion, and the payoff is probably towards the end of this decade, and I've got to get somewhere between 10, a company worth 10 and 20 billion based on a technology that is proven, but also in some ways proven that it's really hard. What is, what is the moment where you feel like, and you've done it, you've raised $400 million, which is more money than I think 99% of startups ever raise, where do their greed glands get going, and when do you see the aha moment when they agree to invest? Because yeah. it sounds like a, it sounds like a tough pitch, just strictly from a capital allocation standpoint. Yeah. It, well, maybe I could, I, I'll recapitulate uh, what Paul Graham said to me when he invested in our seed round. Yeah, and he said, you know, if uh, you know, Boeing's worth on the order of a hundred billion dollars, yeah, uh, if if you succeed. Um, you're going to be worth way more than Boeing is. Call it $200 billion. If I think you have only a 1% chance of success, you're worth $2 billion today, and you're selling me shares for a $15 million valuation, this is the best investment I've ever made. Got it. Uh, so that was, that was his logic. And, uh, but I, I, think there's some, I think there's some truth to this. Like, the size of the prize is very large. Like, our ultimate goal is to replace subsonic travel with supersonic travel on every route for everybody. Yeah. And uh, if we, the, the market is telling us we've got a very low chance of success based yeah. on what their valuations are now. Because if that happens, that is, an, that is one of the most valuable companies on the planet. So the size of the prize is very large. And, uh, and what we've done along the way is systematically de-risk the business. So the, the, the strategy I learned there was, let's, let's make a list of all the reasons this could fail. 
Uh, there isn't a market demand for it. The, uh, we can't manage to actually build a supersonic airplane. The supply chain doesn't sign up. The regulators aren't cooperating with us, um, et cetera, et cetera. You make a whole laundry list of all the Eeyore reasons. And I, I went and did this, and I felt really depressed when I got to the bottom of it. And then I said, okay, well, what can I actually do to tangibly, and, and tangibly is a key word, tangibly reduce each of those risks? So uh, we launched a presale strategy. Uh, we got airlines to put cash in uh, that, that, that's non-refundable that says that they want this airplane that we're building. And so that reduced market risk. And we built a subscale test airplane to demonstrate to ourselves uh, and to our, to our customers and investors that we actually can build a supersonic jet. Um, and it, it kind of goes down this list. And so we sort of spiral through. What are all the reasons this might not work? Let's go, things, go do things that are diligible, diligenceable milestones mm -hmm. that show that we've taken those risks down. And when that happens, OK, now you know, if, you, if you think of this as a X billion dollar company in success, there's some percent chance of success. The, multiply those together. That's your valuation. That number should go up over time if you're de-risking the business successfully. And, and so, so far, we've been able to do that. Uh, where the you know w w round to round we show we've eliminated risk the valuation goes up investors who've been in since the early days are happy because the, they they get their marks and then uh, and they're still like you know in my view we're still in diapers um, like the, this the, the, our, you know we're raising capital recently at valuations well under what I think this will be worth uh, it, you know, if and when we make it successful and uh, whenever I'm um Involved with the startup or founder, I, I say, what's, where's the friction here? Is it capital? Is it people? Is it waiting for the technology to catch up? Is it finding the right people to make sure that there's execution? If you could solve for one problem, what would it be right now? In my mind, well, if I could do two, it's, it's capital and it's execution. I mean, we are, like, like I said before, what we're doing is super, it's super complicated and it's safety critical. There, there has not been a new commercial aircraft company, uh, privately founded, entrepreneur-led since 1921 when Douglas Aircraft was founded. And, and, and by the way, Douglas's first aircraft was like a single engine propeller thing. It was like way simpler than what we're doing. And, uh, and there, are, there are a lot of ways to get airplanes wrong. And so having a high quality team doing the right technical testing as we go, making sure we pick the right suppliers that are gonna get the parts right, um, like all of that is critical, and you know, like we're getting up every day doing engineering reviews, doing supply reviews, bringing in third parties to look over our shoulder, saying what mistake. Let's make sure if there's a mistake in here, we're finding it now and fixing it, mm -hmm. uh, while it's while it's cheap and easy to fix. So that that's one, and then the other the other is capital. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, uh, it, it is capital intensive and capital, uh, but enough enough capital, the technology is there, the market is there. So. Uh, I've, been, I've been a founder of several companies, and, but they've been the kind of companies that the lag time between getting some sort of proof of concept and then iterating was, right, we've got to build a website and get inventory in an e-commerce company. That's six months, maybe 12 months. Services company, you kind of flip on the switch and just see if you can get clients. Um, this, it strikes me this would be just such a lonely, stressful path to be talking about something that's this far out that's this complicated, that requires this much capital, and quite frankly, just so much can go wrong. Like, does this take a toll on you personally, or are you sort of kind of a strange human? Like, how do you, how do, I, would, I would just, this sounds like um, it would take such a personal toll. Like, so, what, what advice do you have to founders around personality traits um, for someone who can raise $400 million and then go out and raise money for a highly complex product, you need another 1.6 billion. I mean, do you sleep well at night? I sleep great. Uh, I'm, I'm actually one of the things is focus on sleep. It really matters. Yeah. Uh, but but maybe maybe one way to answer this is so my my first company. I'm a little embarrassed to say this. Like we built a barcode scanning game. Right. Like if you made a list of like most important things to least important things on the planet, like I think we set a new low. And um, like I would uh, and yet. Because I'm a founder type, you know, I'm always at my personal red line. But I, I would get up in the morning, and I was um, it, there were times where I was like near suicidally depressed, as I, I would think, why in the world did I get into this thing? I'm building something that I don't care if it exists in the world. I thought it was like what I knew how to how do. How old were you, Blake? I was in, right around thirty. 
Um, and it was, uh, and I, th I thought I would crash the company, would lose everyone's money. I thought my career would be over. Like it was incredibly stressful. And you know, and then when we managed to sell the company in the end, it was this enormous relief. And and I remember thinking like, like I worked so hard for something I didn't care about. And um, and so I knew, you know, like the founding bug had kind of bit me. I knew I wanted to do another startup, but I, I didn't want to ever have that experience again of getting up in the morning and saying, "Is this worth it?" And you know, there are there are ups and downs to any business, but I I, I think I've come to believe is that as founders, we're going to be at our personal red line no matter what we're doing. But but what we do get to control is have we picked a mission that motivates us, uh, that's worth it. And uh, for me, if I'm going to work that hard, uh, if I'm going to put myself, all of myself into it, if I'm going to see my kids less, uh, it better be something that matters to me. And I am you know, deeply motivated that this is something that should exist. And I would, you know, I'd much rather, I'd much rather try and fail than never have tried. And so uh, this, this, maybe this will validate that I am actually a crazy person, but. Um, like I find this easier than my first company because it's more motivating, and it's more motivating to me, and I can get great people to come and work with us. Uh, like the quality of team I have around me, I would not be able to get to do if we picked a lesser mission. So you've worked at Amazon, you've worked at Groupon, you've worked at some great companies, um, and you've worked at Groupon. Um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Um, well, I, I, seriously, I, 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 and one of my experiences has been that it helps to learn from contrast. Like. It, Amazon was Groupon, like Groupon's a successful company. I'm being a cynic here. No, um, like Amazon is a really well-run company, and yeah, I, I went that. there like first job out of school, and I had no idea how good I had it. And then, then a startup, and then what did you do at Amazon? I was I started as a software engineer, and then I, I built search engine marketing basically. Uh, but then I then I ended up at Groupon after they bought my first company. And, and comparing those two companies and how they were run was actually extraordinarily. Um, uh, helpful because the the contrast showed what really mattered in the culture and what really mattered in the decision making. So, a group of founders, what two or three lessons or pieces of advice would you give to founders and CEOs of startups that that you learned um, at or the, learned anywhere? The, the number one thing is work on something that that you really love. And it's it's a it's a cliche, but I think it's I think it's true. Pick a mission that's inspiring. Uh, pick, a, pick a mission that you care more about than you care about your own insecurities. And uh, because the, I mean, like on day one, I, I looked in the mirror in this thing, and I'm like, I am not the human that has the, the resume to do this or the skills to do this. I'm going to have to reinvent who I am along the way. But this is worth it. I want to make a run at it. And uh, what I found is that, that knowledge and skills are way more variable than passion. Uh, like, I hopped industries, and I think, I think people underestimate what they can learn. If they're if they're motivated to do it, and so pick pick something that that you really want to exist in the world, and go lock onto that, and then become the person that's the person to, to be able to do it. Uh, so, in addition to following your passion, um, what like management techniques or or hacks for building a company? Um, what what are what? Um, oh, let me start. Some of the biggest management yeah. mistakes you've made. Oh. Uh, I've made a lot. All, all my worst mistakes have been people mistakes. Mm -hmm. um, uh, miss, m m picking people who are maybe strong technically, but weren't weren't good culture fits. Underweighting that was a, that was a big mistake. Uh, but you know, one thing I can share that might might be useful is uh, how I learned to interview people who were t technically deep in a field I was initially not technically deep in. Mm -hmm. And uh, my fa my favorite interview question was, "Teach me something." And so like, all the early engineers, OK, come meet Blake. Yeah. Uh, teach me something. And, uh, and so either, so A, I got to learn a lot of stuff. But I ended up only hiring people who um, deeply actually understood something and were good enough communicators that they could convey it. And, uh, and it turns out it's, um, it's easy to assess the answer to that question without knowing the technical substance of it yourself on day one, because like at the end of the conversation, either, either I understood it or I didn't. And, and so people who were able to communicate deep technical content well were the, the, the people who got hired. And it, it turned out I could assess that without having all that knowledge myself a priori. So advice to a young person who maybe hasn't figured out what their calling is or what the passion is that would override their insecurities. 
what advice would you have for them around where they should work or what type of skills they should try and develop that would give them the opportunity to be successful once they figured that out? Well, I, I think back to my decision to join Amazon uh, right after school, and I, I had a couple different job offers. Uh, there was one that was a lot of money. Uh, the Amazon offer was not a lot of money. Uh, but everybody, everybody I talked to at Amazon were really smart people, and I thought what they were working on was really cool. And uh, I look back, and like th those two criteria, I think, were really helpful. Work with great people and work on something that maybe it's not your life's work, but if you think it's really cool, you're going to be motivated. Mm -hmm. And so th those two things together, I think, are, uh, they, they help me a lot. Got it. I wanted to open up for questions. Does anyone have any questions for Blake? Please introduce yourself. And I'll repeat the question because you're not mic'd. Uh, Michael Schneider from Los Angeles. My question is, if you're going to go through and do this really, really hard thing, why stop at Mach 1.7? Why not go to Mach 3 or 4 or whatever? So Michael's asking, why stop at Mach 1.7? Why not go to 3 or 4? Oh, oh man. Uh, it's a gr uh, gr great question. So, so the, the first airplane, this, this might surprise people, is uh, super technically conservative. Um, uh, we only are using technologies that have been proven safe, reliable, efficient on other airplanes and have a certification precedent with regulators around the world. And so that's a, uh, that, that allows us, because the, the, the complexity of the whole thing creates a bunch of risk. And uh, so wherever we have an option, we want to take the less risky path. And it, it turns out Mach 1.7, the material systems that were already certified uh, that were already certified for the 787 and the A350 uh, work unmodified. Uh, they're already FAA certified materials databases, allowables, mater uh, manufacturing, supply chain, et cetera. So at 1.7, I don't need to invent anything new and I don't need to certify anything new. And now, yeah, more speed would be better, but our, our view is let's, let's birth the first airplane successfully and, uh, and we already have a, a, a small team working on Airplane 2, Airplane 3. And uh, yeah, I think, we can, I think we can be significantly faster. The, 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 over, the long term development arc here is to get the fares down to the point that more people can afford to fly on this, to put the sonic boom question in the rearview mirror so we can fly supersonic everywhere, uh, and then be able to push speeds up because you know, in, until, until we have like a you know, 50 millisecond transporter beam, I don't think there's a diminishing return on speed. How high does the plane fly, Blake? 60,000 feet. So 60, that's feet. so the, the sky is a deeper blue, and um, if, the, if, the if, the, of the Earth? if it's curved, we'll be able to see it. <laughs> well, we'll have to see. Hello. Please introduce yourself. A, a plan, so someone's asking if you have a plan B. Do you mean professionally? Oh, no, for the company or uh, yeah. For the company. Um, so plan B, like, produce something else? I don't know. Maybe selling the chefs, entering another business, I don't know. Do you have a plan B question mark? Uh, no, let's make plan A work. Yeah, like, you know, I deeply... Um, it, it, at this point, I'm, not, I'm nine years in, and uh, when did you start the company, Blake? 20, 2014. So um, this is nine years. So nine, this really I'm, is. You're going to be, you're in this thing for 20 years plus if it's a, if it's that's right. If it's, a but it's, it's worth it. Yes. It's worth it yeah. to me. Um, and you know, at this point, like I know enough about the technology, the market, the regulations, the supply chain. Um, this is all possible, and the the only question is whether we will do it successfully. And there's no there's no guarantee to it. But, um, but it's, uh, it's, it's, if, if we execute this successfully, it will work. Uh, and, and so it's focus on execution. And I, I don't think about plan B. I think about how to make plan A work. Why would United put hard money down as opposed to just wait? Is it they want to be first in line? Um, United uh, had an incredible success uh, announcing, being the first US airline to, to announce supersonic. So. And uh, it blew, it blew everybody away from their expectations. Uh, they, had, they had customers calling up and saying, uh, I, I actually am switching airlines today because uh, I want to be first to go supersonic. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the, the ability for them to go have a, you know, a, a advantage place on a, a next-gen technology was huge. And the, um, when we talked to passengers, uh, virtually everyone wants supersonic. And the thing that um, 
it surprised me how strong it was. 87% of, of people who fly first or business internationally today would switch airlines, walk away from their status and their miles in order to access a much faster flight. And, and what, that, what that means is it's a loyalty program buster. Yeah. Uh, like it, if, if United has supersonic on a route and the competing airlines don't, um, they're going to pick up a lot more passengers. Uh, and they're mo and they're, these are the most profitable, most valuable passengers. Uh, so it's, th this is a, you I think you can always tell an industry that doesn't have a lot of product differentiation when they've got really strong loyalty programs. Like you see it in airlines and grocery stores. Um, and, uh, and this is, th there hasn't been differentiation in air travel products since the first jets came online. Mm -hmm. And yet today it's like, fly my airline, I got a better wine list. That's remarkable. And this is, this is a really com powerful competitive tool um, uh, and, it, and it starts working even before the airplane's delivered because the, the, uh, the customers want it so much and they want to be with the airlines that are innovative. So I have one more question and we'll take one more from the audience. But um, this is, strikes me that as you get closer to proof of conce concept, the, the, just the category makes sense. The, I would imagine there's a big market for people who want to get from here to New York in three and a half hours. It just opens up a whole world of possibilities. As you get closer to kind of a minimum, or it just becomes more realistic, who do you think, I gotta believe it'll attract competition. Who do you think is most likely to be your competition here? Is it a Gulfstream, is it a Boeing? Um, you know, I, I think at some point, Boeing and Airbus will say they have to participate. Yeah. Uh, because they're in the airliner business. And um, so that, that'll, you know, that'll happen at some point, I don't know when. Um, you know, I think uh, I think that the makers of, of private jets uh, will will enter when you can fly supersonic over land because that's what makes their business case work. Got it. Uh, a, 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 for a Gulfstream or a Dassault, uh, if you if you there's only a market for 50 airplanes, it doesn't make sense to develop the airplane. There, it, ha it has to be at least a couple hundred. And the 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 way we see the math, and I, I think they see it the same way, which is why they haven't done it is uh, you have to be able to fly supersonic over land. Uh, but I, I, think, uh, I think the advent of supersonic passenger travel in large numbers is going to cause people to say, oh, what is that sonic boom thing? Can I hear one? And then you know, and there are ways to flatten that out. And so people will hear it and be like, that is the reason that I'm stuck in a tin can for six or seven hours. And, and then the rules will get changed very quickly. And then there'll be second generation supersonic airliners that can fly supersonic everywhere. And then, the, and then I think at that point, the business jet game uh, catches up with commercial. But the, the slightly funny thing here is commercial is going to lead and private's going to follow. And, it, and it's because of that regulatory situation around, uh, uh, around speed. I disagree with him on this. I just think there's so many people out there. I mean, why, if you were worth a billion dollars, why wouldn't you buy this thing, right? I mean, just why wouldn't you? I, 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 we argue about this. I think it's going to be, I think the market's going to be essentially every billionaire in the world who has a finite amount of time. Anyway, sir, your last question. Uh, last question. I was just, uh, my name's Tim, I'm from London. I just wanted to link together a couple of the things you've told us. Uh, you talked about capital being the great differentiator, but you've already been doing this in nine years. How did you persuade those first private capital providers we're looking for you know, three to seven years to, to, to get out of this, that they might be locked in for 15 or 20 before they saw, or somebody that they were going to pass it on to was going to see a meaningful return. So just to repeat the question, how did you convince early capital to come in recognizing that their time to liquidity might be a decade plus? Is that, yeah. Is that fair? Yeah. Yeah. The, the, the earliest investors are the ones that were least time sensitive. And they were, they were focused on uh, you know, multiple returns. Yep. They were focused on IRR. Uh, but uh, anybody who is focused on returning capital to investors quickly would not be an early investor in a supersonic jet startup. But also, in a couple of years, as this gets closer to fruition and the market gets more excited and sees it as viable in a big market, you, there'll probably be a secondary market. They, there'll yeah. probably be opportunities for liquidity as there are with other companies, to right? Totally. And I think there's a good chance that Boom ends, ends up as a public company you know, but before we've delivered the first airplane. Right. Um, and, uh, and that gets everyone liquid. I, I just want to say, and obviously I'm biased here, I just think it's wonderful that there's guys like you that are just this fucking crazy. I just, <laughs> right? Isn't that, you want, you want people to think, okay, 
I worked at, Gr I work at Groupon. I'm going to build a plane that goes 1,300 miles an hour and figures out a way to raise a half a billion dollars. I think it's just remarkable. I don't, I don't know what are the wrong or the right toys you played with, but I just I wonder, like, how does that happen? Anyways, Blake, yeah. uh, founder and CEO of Boom Supersonic, an American aviation firm that is building the world's fastest commercial plane. I think everyone's on your side. I think everyone would really like to see this happen. That's, uh, Scott, that's why it's going to work because uh, uh, people want this product and they get inspired by it and they, they, they join the team or they become a fan or they become an investor or they become a customer. And uh, uh, it, it's all possible with really great people being behind it. And the, the mission is magnetic, that idea of, you know, let's make the, it's, it's not about speed being cool, although it is darn cool. It's about, you know, where can I vacation? Uh, who can I fall in love with? You know, who, uh, can, I, can I be close to my family? And that is something that I think, uh, as humans, we, we are very magnetically attracted to. And that's what allows this to, to get momentum. Who can I fall in love with? I think that's a good tagline for a company, right? Who can I fall in love with? Blake, we appreciate your time. Join me in recognizing Blake Scholl.